This week we're in a different kind of chapter. It's a difficult chapter in a lot of ways. It's, uh, it's one of those chapters where you look at and think, now how on earth could you teach a chapter like that and come and give anybody anything more than gristle to chew on? Because it's largely genealogies. Genesis chapter 36. This is a difficult section. It's about uh, 30 verses that describes for us the descendants of Esau. And what's difficult about it, one of the things that's difficult, it's loaded with lots of obscure names and obscure places. Now sometimes when we hear obscure names and obscure places, it triggers our interest. This morning we had a speaker from a, a far corner of India named, can you say it? Can you say his name? Lankantong. Lankantong Lian Sao. Pretty good. I think I got it there. And uh, I just pulled it up on Facebook. Now, his cousin, who was at Buena Park Bible Church 10 years ago, is Dong Zetong. Uh, Dong Zetong's brother led Lung Kung Tong to the Lord uh, about 20 years ago. But if you look at where they live, I mean, places like, I don't even know if I can pronounce it, Churachanpur, Manipur, India. And then I go through his friends list, Hinkoth. Thung, tung, nung, chin, chin, tung, nung, and on it goes. I mean, these are very, very foreign names. Very, very foreign places. And we have some interest in it because we're discovering these are our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And, and, and the Lord is uh, calling people to himself in that far-flung place. We come to this text tonight, and it's loaded with obscure names in obscure places, and one of the sad things is, for the most part, these are people who don't know the Lord. These are the descendants of Jacob's brother, Esau. Esau, his line, his descendants are outside of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. God made a covenant with Abraham and for his descendants, but that promise was funneled over to Isaac, not Ishmael. Ishmael would go on to give... uh, Twelve tribes would come from him and populate much of the ancient world. And then from Isaac came his two boys. There's Jacob and Esau. The promise goes down to Jacob, not Esau. And we'll see from Esau there's about a dozen tribes or clans that will come off from them. Now, God is keeping his word. God made promises to Ishmael. God made promises to Esau as well. And that's one of the things that, that these chapters are included to show us that even those who are outside the main line of God's working, God had made promises to them, and he keeps those promises as well. So this is going to be an unusual section. Um, Moses, uh, who was the leader of Israel when he wrote this, uh, likely combined some different sources that he had. We're going to see some repetition um, as we go through this chapter. I want you to notice, though, about half a dozen things as we go through this chapter tonight. Number one, you'll notice the multiplication of the descendants of Esau. They're going to break up into about 12 tribes. That sounds similar, doesn't it? How many tribes of Israel are there? Well, 13, actually. It's a baker's dozen. And, and Esau's tribes, one list there's 14, another list there's 11. It's, it's about, the same, about the same for Ishmael, too. We're going to learn in this chapter where one of Israel's greatest enemies came from, the Amalekites. They are part of uh, a branch that shoots off from the descendants of Esau. I want you to notice as we read through the names, how many times you see the name Baal, the pagan Canaanite god. His name starts being used in people's names. The descendants of Esau we discover, are descending into paganism. There's even some of their leaders named Hadad, who was the Edomite storm god. They are not, as as a whole, they are not a people who are beholden to the Lord. Notice also as we read this chapter how the Edomites start to intermarry with the Canaanites round about them, something that Israel was explicitly warned not to do. They're to learn from the negatives of what Edom is doing. 
On the plus side, we'll note in this chapter the success that the Edomites have in taking the land. God did not give them the promised land, but he did say that they would have another land, and they with great success take it. And that, I think, is supposed to encourage Israel as they're going out of Egypt, as they're reading the story for the first time, that they're going to a land, a special land that the Lord has secured for them. We're also going to see near the end of this chapter how the Edomites start to have kings that rule over them. There's going to be eight dynasties of Edomites before Israel even comes into the land. But God is going to design for Israel a better kind of dynasty. You know, when Israel is a united kingdom, after Saul, after the mistake and the embarrassment of Saul is over with, you get the house of David and Solomon. And then, then the southern kingdom that continues, it's this long line of David that even though it's broken off for a time, it picks back up again with the great son of David, Jesus Christ. Edom doesn't have any stability like that. They got one family ruling and pop, he's knocked off another family ruling, he's knocked off another family and it ping-pongs back and forth. God is preparing Israel as they read this for something better. All right, well, uh, I want you to uh, this is a chart that you don't have today. This is a, a chart of the book of, of Genesis as a whole. And uh, I've shared with you before that the book of Genesis breaks up into ten sections. The first four are about the earliest period of Israel's history. And then the last six are about the, he- the p- period of the patriarchs. And of those six, five of them link together. And the way they link together is each time it says, these are the generations of so-and-so. In the Hebrew text, there's a little and and these are the generations, and these are the generations of, of, uh, 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 of Isaac, and then we come here to the one about Esau. When we come to the tenth one, the last climactic part of the book, that little and is not there. The last part of the book, one of the longest parts of the book that we'll get into next week, the Lord willing, about Joseph is kind of the climax. It brings the history of Israel almost up to Moses' day. Um, so I won't walk you through that chart sometime later. I'll, uh, perhaps we'll give that to you uh, in a little bit. We'll have some, uh, ma- well, I guess we'll show you this to you now. Uh, let's see if I can get it to go big. Over here on the left, this shows you where the realm of Edom is in comparison with other parts. So Moab is just to the north, and over to the left of that, that's going to be the territory of Israel. Edom will sometimes grow and expand to be a much more significant kingdom. In the days of Jesus, the realm of the Edomians, the Edomites, would expand all the way over far to the west. Herod the Great was an Edomite, an Edomian. Uh, and later on, that great magnificent city of Petra, which was, became famous to western eyes because of, uh, what was his name? Uh, Indiana Jones, yeah, I was about to say Monty Python. That would be a terrible mistake. (laughs) Uh, Indiana Jones made famous the scenes in Petra. That's part of Edom. Uh, Edom is a a place that we are a little bit, maybe a little more familiar with than we might realize. Um, Today, it makes up much of the territory of, uh, of the country of Jordan. The city of Basra, not the Basra of Iraq, but Basra in Edom was for many times, for many years, the capital. And there from a distance, you can see the ruins of it sitting on top of Mount Seir, one of the great mountains, uh, part of that great of the mountain range. Today, as we read uh, about the kings, you'll see some of these cities that are listed here will be, will be, will be mentioned. But I want to bring our attention now back to uh, the chart here. And again, we are in the ninth of ten major sections. Uh, and I don't know if you recall this, but as you go through these ten sections, if you look up here at the top, Creations Fall, that's a fairly long section. It's three chapters. And then um, you go to Adam's race, and that's fairly fast. It's really just over, uh, it's two quick chapters. So that it goes from a uh, slow story to a fast story, then back to a slow story uh, that is, details are given to a fast story. And in the second half of the book, it starts with a slow section. It goes slow, I'm sorry, fast and then slow. Fast and then slow. Fast and then slow. We're in one of those fast sections. We're in the section about Esau's line. 
fast and that in one chapter, hundreds and hundreds of years are going to be covered. Not a lot of attention because Esau is outside the covenant. Uh, when we come to the story of Jacob's son, his sons, particularly Joseph, it's going to really slow down and go into a great deal of detail. All right, so this uh, section of chapter 36 and even the first cha- verse of chapter 37 it has a main heading over here in verse 1. Uh, now these are the records of the generations of Esau. And then Moses explains that is Edom. This was the, the name that he picks up, the name that speaks about of redness. The ground, even in this territory in which they live, is red. Uh, So the man himself and the land in which he lives both have that similarity. Verses 2 through 8 is an introductory discussion in in this long, unusual chapter. It tells us about Esau's family in general and how they migrated to the land of Edom. We're first told about the intermarriages that he has in verses 2 and 3. Esau, verse 2, took his wives from the daughters of Canaan. Uh, Now that's a problem, isn't it? Sons of Abraham are not supposed to be doing that. But Esau has not, doesn't regard the promise, does he? Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan, Adah, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Oholibamah, the daughter of Anna, and the granddaughter of Zibion the Hivite, also Basamoth, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebaioth. Look at that, he's intermarrying with the line of Ishmael. He wants to stay away from Jacob, doesn't he? He's getting all entangled with the wrong people. Now, I, I want to just mention briefly that if you look in previous chapters where his wives are mentioned, there's a couple other places earlier, uh, some of these wives' names are the same and some of them are not. And that could be that he had actually more than three wives, that these are the three who bore him sons. Or it may be that uh, some of the women named earlier had alternate names, just like uh, some of the good people in the Bible do as well. Uh, be that it is may, that the children that are born through these three wives are now listed out in verses 4 and 5. Uh, Adah bore Eliphaz to Esau, and Basamath bore Reuel, and Oholibamah bore Yeush, and Yalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. And then we read about the separation that takes place between him and Jacob. And it's not a separation in the, you know, they had a hot, hot conflict earlier in their life. The separation here is not because of that. It's after, apparently after Jacob has come back or in part when Jacob is away, uh, they they part paths, uh, somewhat like Abraham and Lot parted paths. Verse 6, then Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all his household and his livestock and all his cattle and all his goods which he'd acquired in the land of Canaan. And he went to another land away from his brother Jacob, for their property had become too great for them to live together. And the land where they sojourned could not sustain them because of their livestock. So Esau lived in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom in the days of Moses, the land populated by Esau's descendants, again, wasn't known as the nation of Esau. It was known by his second name, Edom. Well, now the heart of this chapter starts off, and we have from verses 9 to 43 a discussion of the clans and kings of Esau's descent. And we, there's another heading in verse 9 that introduces the heart of this, These, then, are the records of the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites, and the hill country of Seir. We come to verse 10, and the same three sons who were listed before are going to be listed again. But this time their families are going to be discussed as well. In verse 10, we're introduced to the families of Eliphaz and Reuel. These are his first two sons. These are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Esau's wife, Adah, Reuel, the son of Esau's wife, Basamoth. And then, then the third wife, Adah, uh, I'm sorry, we come back to uh, Adah's son, Eliphaz, in verses 11 to 12. The sons of Eliphaz, son number one, were Taman, Omar, Zepho, and Gatam, and Kenaz. Timnah was a concubine of Esau's son, Eliphaz, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. 
These are the sons of Esau's wife, Adah. Wife number one, five sons come from them, and there's a sixth one that we've just read in verse 12. This is where the Amalekites come from, through his somewhat maybe illegitimate son, through a slave wife, there in verse 12. And then we come to the second son and his family in verse 13. These are the sons of Reuel, Naharoth, and Zarah, Shammah, and Misah. These were the sons of Esau's wife, Basamoth. And then down to verse 14. The third wife, Oholibamah, she has three sons. And we, we read, these were the sons of Esau's wife, Oholibamah, the daughter of Anna and the granddaughter of Zibion. She bore to Esau Yeush and Yalam and Korah. No grandchildren listed for them. So there are the, uh, apparently these three sons were least favored and they get the least amount of uh, attention. We come to verse 15 and now these same sons are going to be described as the leaders of clans. They are chiefs. They are triumphant chiefs who take over the land and start to populate it with uh, their descendants. There are going to be 14 chiefs that descend from Esau described in verses 15 and 19. Um, the listings of these chiefs' names suggest that these individuals become the heads of tribes. The sons of Israel are going to lead tribes, aren't they? Uh, so likewise, the sons of Esau, as well as some other di uh, distant descendants, are going to lead the tribes of Edom. There's an introduction in verse 15 at the beginning of it. These are the chiefs of the sons of Esau. And now we see that the ones descended from wife number one, her son Eliphaz. They're listed out now for us in the middle of verse 15. The sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, are chief Taman, chief Omar, chief Zepho, chief Kanaz, chief Korah, chief Katam, chief Amalek. These are the chiefs descended from Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Ada. By the way, did you see that name there in verse 15? Eliphaz. Eliphaz. Where does that come from? Where, who does that remind you of? Um, in the book of Job, there are some miserable comforters, one of whom is named Eliphaz. It might be him. It could be him. It's early. Eliphaz claims to know the Lord, uh, and he's not too far removed uh, from Esau. There is also, as we read for the, some, other, some of the places in the book of Job are listed here. Job seems to be related to the Edomites. He's an Edomite relative who seems to have a knowledge of God. Early on in their history, there were some who maintained that. Later on in their history, and the further we read, we're going to see some of these names start to have Baal in them, unfortunately. Uh, look with me now in verse 17. Here's the second son, uh, Reuel, some chiefs who descend from him. These are the sons of Reuel, Esau's son, chief Nahath, chief Zorah, chief Shammah, chief Mitzah. These are the chiefs descended from Reuel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Basamoth. And then lastly, we have the Oholibamah's three sons. Uh, these are the sons of Esau's wife, Oholibamah, Chief Jeush, Chief Yalam, Chief Korah. These are the chiefs descended from Esau's wife, Aholibamah, the daughter of Anna. And then we have a conclusion to this little section. These are the sons of Esau, that is Edom, and these are their chiefs. This has sort of an official ring to it, doesn't it? It's this sort of official, these are, this, this is their names. And so it may be that Moses has gotten a hold of some official list of some sort that was, uh, that, uh, Helped him to compose this. Uh, now, notice we come to verses 20 to 30, and we stop talking about the sons of Esau, and we start talking about some other people, people who used to live in that territory, people who had been there for a long time, people who had their own tribes, and they got pushed out or mixed up. We're going to read now about the Horites, seven of their chiefs who are dispossessed of the land. By Esau's descendants. There's an introduction to this. Now, the sons of Seir, he, uh, Seir is the father of seven clans of Horites who used to possess that land, verses 20 to 21 tell us. 
um, uh, verse 20. Now, oh, let's see, I'm about to read you from Joseph's dream. That's the wrong chapter. The, these are the sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land, Lotan, and Shobal, and Zibion, and Anah, and Dishon, and Ezer, and Dishan. These are the chiefs descended from the Horites, the son of Seir, in the land of Edom. There's an explanation for what's happening here later on in the Torah. Moses, as he gets the second generation of Hebrews ready to go into the promised land, explains to them the trouble they're going to have with the Edomites. And he explains how the Edomites had kicked other people out. Uh, Deuteronomy 2, verse 12 says, The Horites formerly lived in Seir, but the sons of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and settled in their place, just as Israel did to the land of the possession which the Lord gave to them. The Horites, they are called. Who these folks are exactly ethnically is debated. Some have thought they were related to the great Hurrian people, but we don't know. They were known then, weren't they? And here is a list of their seven sons, their clans. The development of the seven sons' clans are listed out in verses 22 to 28. Uh, the sons of Lotan were Hori and Hamam, and Lotan's sister was Timnah. These are the sons of Shobal, Alvan, and Mahanath, and Ebal. Shepho and Amon. These are the sons of Zibion, Ahya and Anna. Uh, he is the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness when he was pasturing the donkeys of his father Zibion. And we say, well, I'm glad they explained that because I was confused. Now, uh, actually, there was another Anna mentioned. Back in verse 20, one of the sons of Seir, the, the last one in the end of verse 20 is named Anna. And now we come down here to verse 24, and there's another Anna. So what Moses is saying is, this is not the same Anna as up there. This is his nephew. This is the guy who found those, found those famous hot springs that everybody knows about. So it's just a little tool that Moses has to explain this is a different person that was mentioned before. Uh, verse 25, these are the children of Anna, Deshon and Aholibama, the daughter of Anah. These are the sons of Dishon, Himdan, and Ishban, and Ithron, and Charan. These are the sons of Ezer, Belchan, and Zavan, and Akan. These are the sons of Dishon, Uz, and Aran. Uz, you see that? Uz, where um, Job was from the land of Uz. Uh, see, that this is part of the evidence that Job was actually a godly Edomite descent relative of Abraham. Um, now there's a conclusion to this. These are the chiefs descended from the Horites, Chief Lotan, Chief Shabal, Chief Zibion, Chief Anna, Chief Dehon, Chief Etzer, Chief Deshan. These are the chiefs descended from the Horites according to their various chiefs in the land of Seir. And you think to yourself now, you've read all that and think, okay, uh, what do I do with that? And the answer is, not much. There's not much devotional value from that list. The reason Moses is speeding through hundreds and hundreds of years and with lists of names is because these folks, though they're related, are outside the covenant. God is going to give greater attention to those who are in his plan. And, you know, there is something to be said about that. There, there, God knows everyone's name. There's a sense in which God, there's a love that God has for all people. He loves the world, uh, the breath we breathe, the common grace that we enjoy is part of it. But there is a, an intensity of focus and an intensity of love that he shows to those who know him. And that's illustrated even in the way these stories are told. As we come to the next chapter in, uh, next week, the, the pace of the storytelling slows dramatically down. As we come back into the promised line, and the life of one of Jacob's famous sons, Joseph. Well, these uh, folks from Seir were overtaken by the Edomites. They intermarried with them. And then after the Edomites get control of the land completely, they start to have kings. And we come to verse 31, and uh, we read that Edom, even before Israel ever thought about having a king, they had eight different dynasties. Look at verse 31. 
Now these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the sons of Israel. Now when Moses wrote that, he wasn't a king. Uh, Israel would not have a king for hundreds of years. But Moses prophesied that they would. Both what he, he spoke about, he gave instructions, when you have a king, he is to do this. And he recorded the words of the prophet Balaam, who said that there would be a star who would arise, like there would be a king over the people uh, of Israel. So um, part of the reason this is included is to show, you know, Israel, the Edomites are not in the main flow of things, but look how settled they are in the land that God gave to them. If you will walk in my ways, I will settle you in your land. I will open up the way and make a place for you. So very quickly, we'll go through the list of kings from verse 32. We'll see that there's eight different kings. None of them are related to each other. Uh, most of them not even reigning in the same city. Uh, one king dies and another king starts reigning. They might even have overlapped with each other in some instances. They're going to be in different cities, uh, some of which we know where they are, like Basra was for a long time the capital of Edom. Taman is a city that's close down to the Red Sea. Other than we, we can't even place Din Haba, I don't think anybody really knows where that is anymore, but it was known in those days. So I'll just read, instead of walking through the chart with you, I'll just read down to verse 39 and the different names of the, the kings of the Edomites who eventually came to power beginning now in uh, verse 32. Balah, the son of Baor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dinhabah. Then Balah died, and Jabob, the son of Zerah of Basra, became king in his place. Then Jabob died, and Husham of the land of the Temanites became king in his place. Then Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Badad, who defeated Midian in the field of Moab, became king in his place, and the name of his city was Avith. Do you remember when I mentioned before Hadad, that second name there in verse 35, what that was? This is the name of the Edomite storm god. This is one of their Baals. He's named after a pagan, a pagan god. And verse 36, Then Hadad died, and Samlah of Masrakah became king in his place. Then Samlah died, and Shaul of Rehoboth on the Euphrates River became king in his place. Uh, by the way, Shaul, that's the exact same spelling of Saul. It's just spelled differently here so people wouldn't confuse them. But in the Hebrew text, it's the same word. Uh, probably, you notice the New American Standard has added the word Euphrates. Uh, te literally, the text just says Rehoboth, which means a broad place, a broad place on the river. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not certain that he is actually from the Euphrates. That's an interpretation. Verse 38, then Shaul died, and Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, became king in his place. There is Baal in someone's name. These guys are not like Job. <laughs> Their parents are naming them after pagan gods. Verse 39, Then Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died, and Chador became king in his place. And the name of his city was Pau, and his wife's name was Mehetabel, the daughter of Matred, daughter of Mezaheb. Eight kings. Not that famous to us. If I gave you a quiz right now and told you to close your Bible, you might remember one of them. And I'll bet by next week you'd have forgotten all of them. The Bible doesn't say much about them. They're not in the main line. But uh, God is going to set up a kingdom for Israel later that has a great, 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 great king who is going to reign forever. Well, this section ends in verse 40. There is now a list of 11 chiefs of Esau. Earlier, we had a list of 14 chiefs. Now we have 11. Uh, and the difference between these uh, might be uh, that some time has passed uh, and the tribes have restructured themselves. You know, in the days of Israel, some of the tribes almost got completely destroyed. Um, uh, so there's perhaps some consolidating that's taken place toward the end of, um, uh, closer to the days of Moses. Verse 40, uh, 
There's an introduction. Now these are the names of the chiefs descended from Esau according to their families and their localities and their localities. It also might be that the, the reason the names aren't the same is we're talking now about places on the map. If I say to you, for instance, Manasseh, that could mean two things. That could mean the son of Jacob, but it could also mean what? It could also mean the place on the map. So sometimes the, perhaps these 11 names are places on the map more than they are uh, just the names of the different tribes. But the uh, 11 tribes are delineated now beginning in the middle of verse 40. Chief Timnah, Chief Alva, Chief Jepheth, Chief Oholibama, Chief Elah, Chief Pinnon, Chief Kenaz, Chief Taman, Chief Mibzar, Chief Magdael, Chief Iram. These are the chiefs of Edom, that is Esau, the father of the Edomites, according to their habitations in the land of their possession. That concludes that list. And then there's a verse now, what we call chapter 37, verse 1, probably should have been put here on the end of the chapter because it's a pivot. Uh, look with me in verse 1. Now, Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned, in the land of Canaan, uh, not in the land of Edom. That pivots us back now, but begins then in verse 2, is the rest of the book of Genesis, the last climactic section. Look how verse 2 begins. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. And actually, the generations, that is the sons, the offspring of Jacob, and primarily Joseph. Because Joseph is the one that the Lord is going to raise up to save the whole family. You know, isn't it ironic? He, Abraham, two sons, Isaac, Ishmael. Ishmael's descendants for, at this point, so centuries have gone on, and they're filling the world. They're part of the world. And then uh, Isaac has his son. you got Jacob and Esau. And Esau's descendants start filling the land. And what happens to the descendants of Jacob, though? The tribes. Uh, well, where do they end up? They end up filling the prison <laughs> core of Egypt. They leave their land because they had to, and they end up out of the land for 400 years. But God is preparing them for the idea that they're going to go back to the land of promise. And there in that place, God will dwell with them and make known to them His plan. And it will be theirs, their opportunity to dwell with the Lord in the fullness of the promises. And uh, their failure, they will fail just as Esau's descendants failed to keep the knowledge of the Lord, just as Ishmael's descendants failed to keep the knowledge of the Lord. Israel would ultimately fail, but God's enduring promise to them lives on. And God has, we see in the Scripture, the, the intention of God through Israel was not just that they would be super blessed, that they would be the chosen nation, but that through them all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And now here we are gathered in this far-flung place. If you had said Anaheim to the people of Israel 2,000, 3,000 years ago, they'd say, Anna, what? If we gave them our names, they'd think, who are they? Those are strange names and strange people. But we have been made partakers of the promise. Uh, God in His grace has, 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 has opened up a way for us through the line of Israel. Well, when we come back, next Sunday night. We'll get into chapter 37, uh, the chosen line, and uh, you thought we've had a lot of drama so far. Oh, there's a lot more drama to come. It's still going to seem like the promise is going to hang from a thread as we go chapter to chapter to chapter, but God is holding the thread and is keeping it all together.